glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. He's worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Our God is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory to God. Glory, glory, glory to God. to God. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be praised. I give you all, I give you praise, amen, I bless your name Lord Jesus. Bless your name, Lord. You're worthy to be praised. Glory to God. Are you ready for the word of God today? Are you ready for the word of God today? Amen. Amen. I'm delighted to be back on here tonight. Looks like we have a very good signal today to bring the word of God to you. Thankful to the Lord each time that he gives me to come on here. I'm not going to be long, but I felt the Lord just placed something in my spirit uh, to bring to bring to you something that's of encouragement. My only responsibility is to encourage somebody with the truth of the Word of God. And um, I'm delighted that I can be able to do it um, any time that I can do that. So we're here today, thankful to God for the opportunity that we have, you know, to give Him praise, to give Him glory. And uh, I entitled my topic tonight, because I, I like to do these things, Accepted as You Are, by Mike Kingsley. Accepted as you are. You know, it's very crucial, I believe, you know, to, for me to remind you that God accepts you. It's very crucial, very important for you. Actually, your strength 
and yoke with God, your salvation, your righteousness, everything hinges on God's acceptance of you. It's right there. The John 3.16 actually, by definition, it says, for God loved the world that he gave. But if I want to translate it, it says, for God accepted us and he gave his only begotten son. And therefore, to really start to re-enjoy, we've abused the word of acceptance. We've abused the word of called acceptance. You know, we are no longer accepting people or welcoming people. Uh, society, culture, a lot of things have changed in our way. We perceive others or we see them. We invite them or bring them close by, honor them, respect them. You know, we're a culture that's so fragmented, you know, that's so broken, that's so sick. And the only reason why people are sick inwardly you know, they can't accept one another, they can't love one another, they cannot do it's because, number one, brokenness, brokenness. Number one, brokenness from our Father God, being detached or separated, you know, from our Father God, because nobody has accepted Jesus fully in their life, you know, that will abandon them or their own self but will abandon somebody else you know will not open up their arms or their lives and say you know what we accept of you we love you we respect you we honor you the culture i don't care what country you live in it is broken it is so broken that we are sick of it it is so broken that we don't want it we pretend that we do we don't like our politics because our politics divides us. You know, it does divide us. It does break us. You know, uh, it leaves a lot of enemy. Like this past, you know, few weeks, you know, you know, we are one nation under God, but we, we are not a nation, you know, uh, supposedly who are still under God. I kind of like ask the question. When I started to watch the trend of our interaction, especially based on our on our politics, how many of us are still going to be friends uh, after we, you know the elections are over? Especially for Christians, this was a, quick, a question for Christians because I know how the world operates and stuff. And literally, there's some people who are not talking to each other because they feel like I was on the other side of the aisle and I was this way and I voted for this and I voted for that. And the you know the narratives of our politics have left us so fragmented that most people don't, you won't even see eye to eye, and yet that's only politics. It comes and goes. Presidents come and go. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords does not get away, does not go away. He's, he's king forever, an everlasting God. Wouldn't you be happy to know you and I serve an everlasting Father, an everlasting, an everlasting God? He's not voted in. He's not impeached. He's not all these things crazy stuff people do, you know, to form what we call our democracy. We like it, you know, we because we've determined that it's, you know, for the people, by the people, and we like that. But my point of view is that it leaves us divided. So when you look at that part, then we come into our own, our own families, you know, those people in our own families that, you know, you love them and others you keep them from a distance, you know, and, and then we come to church. The church somehow is also divided, you know, it can be divided on different aisles. I mean, you know, some, some churches like to be totally black and other churches want to be totally white. Other churches want to be totally Asian. Other churches want to be totally African. And so these dividing walls, the entire dividing walls of our cultures and thought and languages and everything like that really keep us away to build these walls between us and yet the bible tells us that you know in 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 ephesians, in ephesians you know there's no jew there's no greek there's no gentile we are, have all been brought into the lordship of jesus christ and all the dividing lines have been removed and broken away so we're accepting of one another so what i'm going to talk about today i'm going to dare to talk about something that's very crucial you're accepted as you are 
in the Christendom, if I might say, we've used that, especially in our enticement to preach the gospel, to bring people into the kingdom of God. We've used that. We've used the narrative that, you know, come as you are. You know, I remember back then when we used, you know, to, used to do crusades, and uh, we used to sing a song, come as you are, da, 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 da. so if everybody hears, come as you are, we don't care what you've gone through and everything like that, and, and, and you know, there's no conditions. And for the most part, once we got the people inside the church, we changed the message. We changed. We started putting a lot of conditions for these people that we invited in, come as you are. We, you bring in the drunkards, you bring in, you know, you know the people from the streets and and uh, everybody, you know, the non-Christians, you, you give them the enticement, just like uh, a good salesman. You, a good salesman will entice you how to buy a car, you know, how to buy a watch. They, they give you what, what it does. You know, this car is like this. You know, it came out this year, it's a Tabo. It's got, a, this, it's, it's got almost, you know, uh, three, 4,000 horsepower. And you get excited. You know, look at the interior, look at the wheels, look at everything. The, the front part of the excitement, you know, I remember that happened to me when I, I'd gone down the street to, you know, buy another car. And, and this guy walked, he, doesn't, he didn't know that I know cars. He didn't know that I, 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 I know cars so well. So you don't just w walk up to me and, and entice me about a car. And uh, so he started talking to me, the good talk, the good sales talk. You know, nice talk. You know, look at this. Look at that. Look at that. Look at this, you know, tint and all of these kind of things that I'm looking at him. And I say, everything has come to me in the back end of his mind psychologically is enticing me because he knows if I just grab a hold of it, commission for him. That's six, seven, seven thousand grand for him right there. So he does not care, you know, that there, there's risk and management. And to be honest with you, I kind of like, you know, like the car, picked it out. And uh, kind of gave it a test drive. And as I was doing a test drive, something wrong messed up in the car. Test drive. Look at that. The language, okay, the language of enticement came to me and I accepted the deal only to find out that when you did the test drive, bring it back, boom. The, pro all the, the, pro the first problem happened on the test drive. <laughs> and so what's, the, my, what's my point, saints? My point is that we have this first, you know, front we put up. The reason why people get dispelled and, and they feel like they're not accept, accepted because we give them a front. You give them a front. You kind of act like you accept them, but you don't. You, you don't care. They don't feel like you care. They don't feel like you're there. And because you don't give them that, you give them a front. It's a phony front. A lot of Christians have that. You know, a lot of Christians have that funny, funny front, you know, and, and, um, and basically that destroys relationships. It destroys relationships. Just like me, I got excited about buying a car because somebody told me it's nice and only to find out, it's, you know, it couldn't go any farther and stuff like that. We, we had that funny front. We, we say, come as you are. And then when they come as they are, we kind of flip the message on them. And we flip the message that maybe Jesus has just changed the message. The one that died, that loved for you and died for you, you know, while you were yet a sinner, he died for you. Now doesn't just love you any kind of way. You, you have a whole lot of work to do in order to impress him. You have a whole lot of work to do in order to do what? To impress him. I'm going to throw a scripture at you. You'll be surprised. And, and, and it's going to amaze you about a loving God who sees you for who you are. Who sees you for what you are. Who watches every deed, whether day and night. Even your thoughts. Even your tomorrow. He watches everything. And he still dares to love you, no matter what. Michael, is that true? Yes, he does. See, that's why we've killed the message of love. We've killed the message of, you know, of grace. We've killed the message of reconciliation. Why? Because we... we We've had this such a level of animosity that has entered Christians who only feel that every bad thing you've done, you deserve to die. You deserve to be punished for that. See, that's what politics does. That's what democracy does. The democracy, you pay for what you're due. Okay? 
But in the kingdom of God, your sins are expunged, provided you come before the Lord, Lordship of Jesus and ask Him for forgiveness and mercy to flow into your life. So instead of you running around for seven years, 17 years, you're still hung around with the heavy load of everything you ever did, questioning whether God loves you, questioning whether people accept you, questioning and everything. That's the message that we need to give to the people of God or remind them, like I'm reminding you right now, that you're accepted of God. You are loved of God. You are God's spatial child of God. You belong to God. You're joined there with Him. You're the up of His eye. Okay? All of these attributes and you know why that value system, that value system is important for you? Because the scriptures already laid out the foundation of who you are, that you came from the image of God. You came from the image of God. You didn't come from somebody. The Bible says he knew you before you were born in your mother's womb. He knew you. And because he knew you, that's very, 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 very intricate for you to understand. You've got to keep that as a special treasure in your, in, your, in, in your treasure trove. Keep it up and know, I am special to God. Be proud. Because when you, when you cannot walk in your confidence about who you know, who you are in Him, the enemy will level you down to anything. The, the, the devil and his cronies will level you to nothing. Because you're acting out what the enemy is telling you. So everybody that watches you thinks you're that. Everybody that watches you thinks you, you're, you know, there's, there's no good thing that's, that can come out of you. This enemy says. And as, I, and, and as I'm, I'm endeavoring to deliver some truth to you, I pray your heart awakens to be reminded, Michael, can I, I don't feel no accepted. I don't, because of the situations that are going on, because my finances because of this yeah i know what you're telling me you're telling me michael i don't feel no accepted at all it doesn't feel that way i know i love god i know i pray i know i go to church i know i give but sometimes i don't feel like i'm accepted of god okay let me ask you a question what do you think it's going to take for you to feel accepted you know what do you feel what are you going to do some people feel like it's an act of what they're supposed to do, and yet it, it's you being. It's, it's an act of you being. It's an act of you realigning yourself into the design, into the plan of God, the way He wanted it from the foundation of the earth. So what makes you feel like not accepted, God? What, what? The first answer that comes to me is this. The doctor in me, okay, the doctor in me is going, to say, is going to say this to you. Because what doctors do is they want to diagnose the problem. You, if, in order for you to cure something, you've got to diagnose the problem. Where is the root of it? Okay? So the doctor in me wants to show you where all our brokenness. Number one, of course, you know, simple, sin. But where does sin originate from? Let's go back into the Garden of Eden. You know, when Adam and Eve had it all. When they didn't need approval from nobody. They didn't need acceptance from nobody. They had all of that. They didn't need to be loved by nobody. God already loved them. They didn't, to, they didn't need their relationship. They didn't need husband and wife to remind each other, Oh, you didn't tell me that you love me. Oh, you didn't. You, maybe I feel like you don't love me. I feel like you're not there. I feel like you're not supportive of me. You know, they never had all of these things that people feel, that we feel, that we are not enough, we are inadequate. They never had all that before the fall. Before the fall, they were complete. They were full of it. Of course, full of God. Full of glory. Full of God's heavenly nature. That's what caused the enemy to be jealous. Because God made them greater, mighty, glorious. They never needed anything. <laughs> Eve never needed makeup. You know, there was a natural beauty about her. You know, she never needed to go to a shopping arcade or mall to, you know, to fix her nails. She never ne needed all of that. You know, she never needed, 
you know, blonde hair, blue hair, red, pink hair, don't laugh, you know. She never did need, need, I have to remind you these things so that you remind us that where our where has our brokenness, our deficit, our inadequacy come from? Where has it come from? Where did the enemy creep in and tell you that you are not enough? Where did he where did that come from? How did you learn to accept your negatives? Empower your negatives so great, like a truckload of negatives, but you cannot accept a truckload of blessings and power. Where did you learn how to grab a hold of this? Because the door was open, and that door was Lucifer being able to alter your identity through a lie, a deceptive lie shifting your thought process giving you like I told you like that car salesman the car salesman comes to you like I told you like it's car salesman he said you know Dean God say look at that fruit look at how beautiful it is look look you know you you can own yourself you can govern yourself you you don't need to be in this garden with him you guys can take over from here everything has already been made all of those deceptive mindsets and and, and lingos all of them going into Eve, and the more she's perceiving, the more she's accepting, the more she's trying to open her mind, the more she is driven inside of the biggest deceptive plan that has caused the world to be in a mess today. It's caused the world to be in a mess today. From the top to bottom, from presidents to mayors, it's caused an entire mess because of a broken identity where we don't feel enough, we don't feel accepted, we don't feel complete. There's a level of what we call, um, I call it the unworthiness, the guilt, the condemnation, the rejection, the uh, inferiority complex. All of these truckloads of negatives and you carry them with you. You take them to church. You come home. You go to work. You don't feed in and everything. Because the enemy find out something. That God put himself into his image. And if the enemy could try to destroy it. He could have. He could own the world. He could lie to the world like he's doing today. But guess what? The story doesn't end when we are defeated. The story doesn't end when we are defeated. The story continues when we have triumph. Because what we lost in Adam and Eve, we regained it through Christ Jesus. Did you hear me? What we lost in, Eve, in Adam and Eve, we captured it back. And here's the problem is that even after we've captured it back, sometimes for some of you, it is impossible for you to have a perception that you have all that pertains to the glory of God. You have all the power. You have all the authority. You have all the blessings. You have all the access. You have all the presence of God. You have everything pertaining to you. But again, again, the old nature, the old thought process, the patterns of the negative track loads, okay, they mess with you, they destroy you, they wear you out, they cause you to be tired, you don't fit in, you feel rejected, you feel guilty, you feel condemned, you feel inferior, you feel unworthy. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, blessed be the God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with what? With every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That ought to answer your question. Okay, blessed be the God, our Father, the Father of Jesus Christ, or the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with what? With every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. What? In Christ Jesus. What is it? Everything. Everything. Didn't we say we lost something? We kind of lost our blessing through Adam and Eve. And now in the new covenant, we understand that we regain all of that. 
and we have it right now. It belongs to you. You're mighty through God. Do you agree that you have more to you than you think you don't have? I can tell you, everything around you can shake. Everything around you can rattle. But if you're still kept with the presence of God, can nobody despise you? You can get back everything. You can have a, there can be a restoration. Amen. A mighty restoration in your life. That's why I came to share this with you, saints. I came to tell you there can be a restoration of everything. So the Bible says we have everything in Christ Jesus. Let me ask you a question based on what I just read right there. What did you do to have all of that that I just read? What did you do? What did you have to do in order to pertain of all the spiritual blessings that God has for you? What? I mean, name it. You're going to tell me, Kingsley, I pray a lot. Kingsley, I read the word of God a lot. Kingsley, I'm a devoted Christian. Kingsley, I've worked with God for 40 years. Kingsley, I've done, you're going to start reading to me everything you've tried, you think can be equated to what God has given you. There is nothing that God is giving you because of what you've done. It's because of what he has done. That, that ain't your salvation. That wasn't your blood. That wasn't, he, you know, your Holy Spirit. That was not your life. That was all his. That was all God. So from Genesis Revelation, God has been giving you. Why has he been giving you? Why has he been blessing you? How could he wake up in the morning and create the entire universe? The sun, the moon, the firmaments, and everything. And, and all of a sudden he wakes up in the morning and says, I have, I have created every beautiful thing and I'm going to place man in it. What did Adam and Eve do? You know, I remember, I remember uh, the late Benson Idahosa. You know, he used to fly with his jet everywhere around the world. And he tells his wife, let's go. They were so poor. He shares his testimony when they were so poor. They had nothing. They couldn't afford anything at all, you know. And from nothing, God blessed them. You know, they had totally, they were, they were rags. Talk about rags. Poverty. That even the poor people call them poor. This was Benison. I love this testimony. They were nothing. But before this man of God went to be with the Lord... He was one of the wealthiest men of God on the continent of Africa. Actually here too. You know? Mighty. He had a jet. So one day he's in Uganda, remember that day, and he's asking his wife, hey, uh, I, let me ask you a question in front of a big conference. And he's asking them a question. He asked the wife and the kids, what did you have to do to get on this plane? Tell me. Did you pay for the ticket? No. Did you buy the fuel? No. Are you the pilot? No. What did you do to get on this plane? Nothing. What did you do? I just put on my sandals, put my bags in, and I loped onto the plane. I like that question. I like that question. What did you do to deserve the salvation that you have? If you try to deny that God has not accepted you, He has not loved you enough, He doesn't care about you, what did you have to do? What, what are you going to do to feel accepted? Because according to the world system, the world system wants you to do so much. They want you to, to laugh right. They want you to talk right. They want you to be tall right. They want to be a person of color. They don't want you to be a... They don't want, if they want you to be white, they want you to be white. If they want you to be brown, they want you to be... Everybody is picky on what they want. So that means you don't fit in their boxes. There are those who accept you for who you are, and there are those who will not. Not everybody's going to like you the same. But that's the world. God is not picky and choosy on what he wants of you, because guess what? At the end of the day, you came from him, and you're returning to him. Tell me, 
if this is not encouraging to your spirit, tell me if this is not uplifting to your soul tonight. The world system will put you under pressure and you think that God puts you under pressure too. How can somebody who found you in your sin already doing your thing? Okay, he found us in our sin. We were doing our thing. We didn't even care. We didn't know how to be saved. We didn't know how to, you know, to be born again. We didn't know how to repent. We were blind. We were lost. And he found us. Pulled us out of the dungeon of death. And loved us. Closed us. Made us special. And that's enough for us to feel accepted. For God loved the world. That he gave. And that's why I read you in this text. He said he's given us all spiritual blessings. That ought to show you. You know this is enough. Enough. To break all your anxiety levels. This is an anxiety killer right here. By you knowing. By accepting that God loves you. By knowing that you're right within God's plan. God's idea, God's truth, it kills anxiety. Anxious people, have you ever been around anxious people? They're unhappy, they're grunted, they're disturbed, their spirit cannot be consecrated, their mind is looping everywhere, they're unthankful, they're ungrateful, they're ungrateful. Even when you open up your mouth and tell, tell them, I love you, they would never feel it because their mind is not concentrated. They don't feel. They've lost their sense of touch, their sense of belonging, their sense of worth. And that's where the enemy wants you to be. That's where the enemy wants you to be. He wants you to lose your sense of worth. He wants to throw condemnation, especially the old condemnation of what you did in the past, especially because you're hanging around people, you know, long-time relationships that have left, that have refused to let you go and walk into your destiny. Every time you try to be great, they try to remind you, remember what you used to do. You remember this, you remember that. You remember when we went to school, remember that. Shut all those doors and walk in your worthiness before God. It takes a great amount of anointing for you to pick yourself up, to get back to the top, and you feel and sense that I am loved of God. It takes a great amount of power. It takes a great amount. Just like the prodigal son, he says, let me rise up. I've lost it all. I've lost my dignity. I've lost my power. I've lost my name. And I almost I've lost my father. But I'm going to get up. And I'm going to walk. And I'm going to go back. I'm unworthy. I'm broken. I'm defeated. I'm beat up. I'm all of that. But I want to regain that which the enemy is trying to take away from me. I want to know that I'm worthy. I want to know that I'm free from self-condemnation. I want to break through every inferiority complex. I don't have to feed in in anyone's narrative. I don't have to act for anyone to like me. You don't have to. You don't have to accept God. <laughs> you know, you know, you don't accept. Here's a problem with a lot of people. He said, you don't accept God's love, but you work so hard to be loved by man. And yet man is, man's love is conditional. Man's love is conditional. They will like you. As long as you still do the right things and all that, man's love is conditional. Somehow. Are you getting it? Are you getting, are you getting something out of this? Are you getting something out of this? Let me read some more. Amen? And it says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the day. What? Just like, just as he chose us. Okay? He chose us before the foundations of the earth that we should be holy and without blame before him. In love, having predestined us to what? To the adoption of sons by, Christ, by Jesus Christ. To himself. To who? To himself. According to the good pleasure of his will. This is all good about him. It's all about him, saints. 
That's how this becomes so beautiful. You know, it becomes so beautiful. See, when the when the true owner of your life comes in, everybody doesn't don't matter. Everybody don't matter. Everybody is just trying to is trying to have a piece of you, a little piece of you. You know, a little control over you, a little mind control over you, and manipulation and deception and lies and everything like that. They don't own you. Look at the things, what I just read you, all good things that God gives you, that God has, that pertains to you right now, it, just in this text alone. You have not done a single thing for you to deserve them, except by aligning yourself into the truth of the word of God. All you have to do is get back to the true identity and to image of God. Michael, how can I do that? Sometimes I feel I don't have strength. Yes, I know. Because the entire battle for humanity is a battle for identity. The entire battle that we've gone through from the day you were born to now is identity. You know, you we go to school to have an identity. To have a, 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 an ed education identity. To have a home identity. To have everything we pertain to buy. It's attributed to who we want to be and how we want to be perceived. Identity. That's why the word of God tells us. He calls us by name. Which name? His name. Why is the name important? Because that's what reveals your identity. So let me help you, saints, to break this, this fallow ground that's clogged in your spirit, that's clogging your mind, that's clogging your heart. And let you know that you're not accepted of God. That's a lie from hell. That's a lie from hell. Okay? Yeah, people can reject you, but people rejecting you doesn't mean that God, <laughs> you know, is the same. Actually, when they walk away from you, that's when Jesus comes in. Don't but never forget that. When all of them turn their backs on you, that's when Jesus walks in. That's why you don't have to abandon God. Don't abandon God. Amen? This is exciting. This is exciting. You know? So, so as, I, as I'm sharing this with you, I want, I want you back. I want you alive again. I want you to be upbeat. I want you to be confident. See, part of God's kingdom is about God having confident kids. You know, I'm a very overconfident guy. Did I just say that to you? Oh, yes, I am. You know why? Because I know every gift that God has placed on the inside of me. All right? I'm, I don't have to be everything to all people. I just have to be everything to me. I wake up feeling every inch of me and know that I belong to God. He has the final say of my destiny. Why would I worry about what people think or about what people say if I am sure in my spirit and my heart of hearts who I am in Christ Jesus. What can man do to you? Oh, Michael, listen, you know, you gotta, you gotta act this kind of way. You know, you know what to do? You know, act, you know, act so that you can fit in. You know, try to, try to act so you can fit in. You know, talk, talk the talk so you can, you know, talk the talk so that people think that you're this or that and everything like that. You know, act weird to be cool. You know how people, they want to act weird to be cool, you know? So that they feed in. That's what the word does. Change your appearance, you know. Change your appearance and, you know, so that, you know, you, you, you're you changing for everybody else but you. Why would you change for man more so than you change for God? And yet the one, the one that wants you to change for him, he says, come as you are. Because you don't know how to fix yourself. You don't. It's his grace and power released on the inside of you. How are you doing, son? 
How are you doing, Esther? Blessings to you guys. You know, it's a blessing for you to receive everything. I mean, everything that God has made available to you. Before you begin to scramble and say, oh God, I need next week. I don't know what I'm going to do next week. Have you been able to use what he already gave you? Because when you understand what he's already given you now, you have energy and power for next week. You already know you're walking in the confidence of knowing the same God who just did this here yesterday. He's the same God that's going to do it again. Glory to God, glory to God. Accepted as you are. Accepted as you are. You are accepted as you are. Put your hands together like this. Just do like this. And close your eyes and begin to breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. And begin to say, I'm accepted as I am. In other words, as you meditate, is you start to remove all the cares of this world. The cares of this world begin to fall away from you. When they begin to fall away from you, you become lighter. You become acceptable. Even your countenance begins to change when you remove all the cares of this world. Remove the guilt. Remove the unworthiness. Remove the inferiority countenance. Never walk in a room. Never walk in a room. I've been in so many rooms. High at the top. I'm fine. I am good. Because I walk in that room with what I have. I walk in that room with everything I have. Alright? Saints? But when you walk in a room with a complex, a mind complex, insecurity, I'll touch on that tomorrow. I see a lot of people today who are very insecure about who they are. People are so insecure about who they are. You know, when you tell them about, about their negatives, they react, they react, they don't want to hear about their negatives. And when you give them compliments about who they are, they still react. They don't know how to take it. That's why I said, as a doctor, I have to go back to diagnose the problem in the Garden of Eden. That's where the biggest lie of deceptive lie ended Eve. And when, when Eve conceived that lie and she lost what she had, all of a sudden she started to need she started to need. When sin came in, she started to need. What? She started to need Adam to tell her, I love you the way you are. She started to need attention. She never needed attention. The Bible, the Bible tells us she was the helpmate. She had come to help Adam. But now, everything has switched. She's in a lot of need. Every single day there has to be an affirmation, an approval. From that day, the race to approval up until now is still going on. How do we come into ourselves and reclaim that which we already are? We're not just going to become, we already are. We already are in Christ Jesus. How do we reclaim that? We need to run back to our Father God. We need to go back to our Father God and reclaim it. And say, so, Lord, we dress, just like the prodigal son, we reclaim our identity, our, the untainted identity, the, the authorized identity, who we are in Christ Jesus. Because he's already said, having predestined us to the adoption as sons by Christ Jesus, having done what? Predestined, everything is in motion, was already placed in motion before the foundations of the earth. No matter what you're wrestling with, as long as you allow yourself to be in God's plan, it was set in motion. You are accepted. You are accepted. So stop wrestling with the devil. Stop wrestling with people. Stop wrestling, trying to feed in, trying to be light, trying to be everything. When I was younger, to be honest with you, I, hey, I wasn't a superhero all the time. When I was younger, yeah, I struggled with that. I went to people for approval. 
I needed somebody to tell me, Michael, you're doing a good job and everything and all that. I needed other eyes to tell me how good I am. And yet I was good. And even they, they were telling me something that I already knew. So something that was, I, I, God gave me the grace over. As a created young man, as a producer, as a great academic young man, they were telling me stuff that I already knew, that I should have already known. But because my inferiority complex told me, uh, maybe, 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 maybe you're good, maybe you're not. So you wrestle with your goodness and you start questioning your authenticity. All of a sudden there's a battle for you and you mess up so much. Every time you struggle with your identity and you cannot walk in the fullness of it, you mess up a lot. And when you mess up, the more the enemy demotes you and throws you into dungeon where you feel like you cannot come out. But today, the Lord gave me a word to tell you, get up, get up, rise up, come out in the name of Jesus. Because you are accepted of the Lord just as you are. Not after you change, just as you are. Because in the process of God loving you, Change happens. Change happens. Saints, this is for you. I'm going to continue with this tomorrow because I know it's good meat. Share this with people that you know are going through a high level of depression. They're sick, downtrodden. Share this with them and tell them, hey, you need to hear the word of God. This is for you. Accepted. As you are, accepted as you are, loved as you are, not when you change. If you try to change for people, you know, guess what? They're going to raise the bar. There's going to be another dimension of their expectation. Okay, now you've done that. Now what about this? And, and guess what? You will be tired because you are only fulfilling the works of the flesh, not the works of the spirit. Through faith in Jesus. Everybody gets ex exhausted. People get exhausted to like you. Unless you build a strong, mighty relationship with people. I love the people that God brings in my life. Because I can be myself around them. They are themselves around me. I don't have to gimmick nothing. I don't need accolades. I try to achieve everything that I want. My education, my everything, because all, that's what, those are the templates I want. I wanted to show people, look here, look at my doctorate, look at my master's, look at this, look at that. Look at everything I got, look at my, my ministry. I wanted all that. Then I found out, mm -mm. at the end of the day, I'm just a vessel. I'm just a vessel. And I hope, I think in this generation, let me say this this way, and then I'm going to close. I think we need strong men and women of God that are not insecure. I am watching on the on a national spectrum, you know, preachers going after each other. Preachers fighting, you know, tell them that I say that. They're fighting each other, calling each other names, trying to expose each other's scene and everything. Nobody wants to cover the other. You know why that is? That is an inferiority complex. The, and it doesn't matter if they have a big church. Underneath all of that. Underneath all that. When you hear a man of God stand on the pulpit and attack another man of God. Underneath that skin. Underneath his suits. There is a, 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 free, a, a inferiority complex. Inferiority complex. There's an ego, a deadly, poisonous, toxic ego that makes him think that by attacking somebody, demoting somebody, it makes him look better. Look at the culture we've created. We're the enemies of each other and we call, we're supposed to be so unique. I don't have to bully you. I don't have to be negative. I, don't, I mean, when people call me and tell me stuff about other people, I take it. I listen. And you know what? I pray. I pray. 
Because at the end of the day, it's you today. Might be somebody else. Because we all need the grace of God until he comes back. Everybody, every man needs the grace. Because I've seen other, I've seen men who have tried to go out against each other. And they fell in the same ditch. They're trying to, they fell in the same ditch. Tonight, my dear friends, God sent me here to give, send this word to you. If it's, it's blessed you, share with your friend. Accept it as you are. Part two will be here tomorrow. I pray that you've been blessed. Amen. I pray that you have been blessed in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Amen. See you tomorrow. Love you guys.